I want you to think about this, this idea of the word peace. Peace is, is common to every, every language, every culture, every nation. What do you think of when you think of the word peace? Hippies. Okay. And he even had his two fingers raised like that, you know. <laughs> Ian, did you have long hair at one stage? Did you? Did you? No, I'm only really joking. So what else do we think of when we think of peace? Silence. Quiet. Silence, quiet. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, y- y- yesterday I had my clicker when Rachel and I were doing the presentation and I said as we were, were getting ready, this is a clicker that we point towards children and they go quiet and someone's eyes lit up and offered to buy it off me, Faith. <laughs> if only, if only. Peace. Anything else in terms of peace? Wholeness. We're going to come on to that. Shelley's ahead of the game. Okay, again, that's another very interesting uh, point because that's, a, that's important and it's important in today's society. Where, where Stuart and Eunice and I come from, one of the phrases that we will use, we'll explain it later if we need to, is give my head peace. Huh? Remember that one, Stuart? If someone's really annoying you, how many times, Dan, your mother would have shouted, give my head peace. In other words, I want a bit of calmness. I want a bit of quiet. You see, the truth is we live in a very complicated world, don't we? We, we live in what psychologists are, are calling an anxiety epidemic. The modern culture in which we live, when you look at all the issues that people are talking about, poor health, difficult relationships, unemployment, poverty, disadvantage, loneliness, work stress, exposure to violence, trauma and conflict, it just seems right around the world, and people are exposed to it through the media in a way that they have never been before. And that's one of the issues as well, the pressures of connectivity and social media. There's people, my, my son never turns his phone off. He's thinking, turn your phone off at night. But there's a problem even with children now, they say, in terms of the youngest of children connected to social media so young that they're getting anxious when they can't connect. That's the society in which we live. So we need this idea of peace. And in the Bible, there's two key words that are used. You're probably familiar with both of them. The first is shalom, the Jewish word. And the second word that's used is is used in the New Testament in the Greek culture. That word irene, from where we get people's names, Irene. It's my mother-in-law's name. It means peace. And as has been pointed out already, the most basic meaning is, is actually uh, the idea of completeness or wholeness with nothing missing. And you know, there's people who spend money on therapists and counselors and we're not against that. But actually, what they need is peace. That's what they're going for. That's what they're looking for. And we can find that part of our message of hope that Mark was talking about is this message of peace that we have. And we'll unpack that a little bit as we go along. But the basic meaning is this idea of completeness or wholeness. I want to talk about three simple areas that I think everyone needs peace in. Firstly, I think we need peace with ourselves. There's an awful lot of people aren't at peace with themselves because they haven't accepted themselves. Now, when most of us were growing up, we probably were taught something of Adam and Eve and the basic stories of the Bible. And we had this idea that God was the creator, that we are made in the image of God. And that is a foundational truth that's missing for many people today. They don't have this idea that they're made in the image of God. And that image of God, we are distinct from the rest of the animal kingdom. Sometimes we may not always act like that. Sometimes people act like animals, don't they? But we are distinct from the animal kingdom because animals will also have rationality and ability and creativity. That's part of being made in the image of God. But the distinct difference is that we are made to have a relationship with God. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. We have this rationality. We have this creativity, which is why things like art is really important. 
which is why things like music are, are, touch our soul at a very deep level, because we are made with that creativity and that bent. But we also have this element of spirituality. But if people do not connect with that, then they're doing violence to their souls. They're, they're not realizing that they are made in the image of God. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people, that's where you need to start. That's where you need to start. The fact that there is a creator and they're made in the image of God. Because one of the challenges, people don't believe that because they're not taught it. And, and so um, 50 years ago, even in this country, basically what you could do is, if you imagine this is, this is the line and, and you would... Uh, people like Billy Graham would ask people to cross the line into salvation. Or people like Reinhard Bonnke who died this week. Great man of God. Uh, preached the gospel for over 60 years. Saw incredible things happen. And he would ask people to cross the line. Because people basically knew the basic stories. So when you presented that Jesus died for our sins. That he was buried. That he rose again. You were asking people to cross the line. Whereas nowadays... People are, are, if you think of it in this way, it's like minus five. Some people have never heard of God. I, I know one pastor who preached and talked about Adam and Eve, and a couple come up afterwards and said, who's this Adam and Eve that you're talking about? Do they live around here? But, because they've never been taught. So we're starting at a place that's kind of minus five. You know that from your conversations and your relationships. You can't just go in and both barrels, because people are going, what are you talking about? They don't know the story. So I think in order for us to be effective in communicating the gospel, this is probably one of our starting points. Anyone else agree? And this is true for us as well. We are called to be in relationship. Now, one of the challenges with that is that how people speak about themselves and how we speak about ourselves. Oswald Chambers, the Christian devotional writer, says this. The way we continually talk about our inabilities is an insult to our creator. To complain over our incompetence is to accuse God of falsely having overlooked us. Get into the habit of examining from God's perspective those things that sound so humble to men. In other words, oh, I'm, I'm not really important. I'm not worth anything. I'm that kind of attitude. You will be amazed at how unbelievably inappropriate and disrespectful they are to him. So I want to encourage you to challenge your own thinking about yourself. How you speak about yourself. How you talk about yourself. And how you let other people do the same. Because we are made in the image of God. We're called to be in relationship. The second area I want to talk about is, is peace with others. The Bible talks about this in, in Proverbs 16. That this idea of to reconcile and heal a relationship is to bring shalom. Some of our relationships need shalom, don't they? In the Bible, when rival kingdoms make shalom, they not only stop fighting, but it's also the means that they work together for other people's benefits. And how many people have struggled with church because they see Christians fighting, because they see politics, because they see nonsense instead of concentrating on the main things, the things that are of first importance. But let's be honest, because we're in church, so we should tell the truth. It's not always easy to live at peace with other people, is it? This is what the scripture says. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do you know what you've discovered and I've discovered? It's not always possible. <laughs> it's not. And it doesn't always depend on you. I, I wish it were always possible, but it's not. So we have to come to that realization and take that pressure off ourselves. That it doesn't always depend on us. Do you know what? Sometimes it's wrong to say sorry. Does that shock you? Sometimes it's wrong to say sorry. Sometimes we actually need to do what Jesus did and just walk away. How many times did Jesus disappoint people? 
How many times did either he walk away from people when he spoke the truth and they wouldn't accept it? Or did he let others walk away from him? Think of the rich young ruler. Jesus loved him, but he let him walk away from him because he didn't want to accept the message that money was his God. What about the people uh, uh, the area where the demoniacs were healed and the, the demons were sent into the pigs and they went over the cliff? What did they come and say to Jesus? Oh, we think this is wonderful. Please have a, a three-week evangelistic campaign. No. They told him to get out of his region. Did Jesus try and persuade them? Did Jesus try and argue with them? Did Jesus try and justify or defend himself? No. The scripture actually says that Pretty quickly, Jesus got into a boat and left the area. You know, sometimes it's not possible to live in peace. And sometimes it doesn't depend on you. Scripture also says that we should make every effort to live in peace. Because maybe you're sitting thinking, oh great, David's giving me a get out clause this Christmas. No, 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 no. (laughs) Sorry. There's no get out clause because the scripture is actually clear that If you know you're not in right relationship with someone, if you're offering a gift at the altar, if you can, you should reconcile. But we have to hold those two scriptures in tension, don't we? We have to know it's not always possible and it doesn't always depend on us. There's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. You know that? You see, forgiveness you have to do for your benefit. You have to forgive people. You even have to forgive me. You have to love me as well, by the way, Dan. It's in the Bible. But you have to forgive me. Because otherwise, it's like drinking poison, poison and expecting the other person to die. Scripture says you have to forgive. We have to live in forgiveness. But reconciliation can only occur when the other person is willing to admit their responsibility in it. Okay? Does that help you? You see, I think at Christmas time... We put ourselves under a lot of pressure. Because we have this almost tinsel, glitter view of Christmas, don't we? But truthfully, we end up meeting family members that we seek to avoid the rest of the year. Come on, you know it's true. That we'd rather not spend time with, to tell jokes that are inappropriate... All of those things that we struggle with and we think, I don't want to be around these people. But we have this idealized view, don't we, of Christmas and and the Christmas cards where the stable's clean. Listen, the shepherds did not smell of peppermint. (laughs) All right? The shepherds were rough, working class people who were despised by the religious leaders. Because they didn't fit into the system. They couldn't go to the temple. Why? Because they were out in the fields. Why do you think the angels came to the fields? Because they weren't in the temple or the holy places. Because they were working looking after the sheep. And they didn't smell nice. Have you ever met a farmer who smells nice? Dan? (laughs) Dan's probably the exception. But he's a farming background. He smells nice now. But the average farmer. The average shepherd. (coughs) So let's, let's get rid of this idealized view of Christmas. That everything should be perfect. Because to be honest, maybe it's just my family. But I remember family Christmases that were more like episodes of EastEnders. <laughs> so can, can we take the pressure and the guilt and the condemnation of ourselves when it comes to living at peace with others? So there's no get out clause. We do need to make every effort. But also... It's not always possible. The same is true in the church where we need to actually strive for unity and peace. That's what Ephesians 4 says. Make every effort to live in unity and peace. And Jesus himself said, do you know what? How are people going to know you're my disciples? Great branding, though we have it. Great advertising, though we have it. Great leaflets, though we have them. No. Buy this Shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for the other. So that's what we should be doing, living in peace as a church. And then the final one really is about living in peace with God. Wonderful verse in the Old Testament that's, that's part of that prophetic promise. Hundreds of years before Jesus is born. For unto us 
a child will be born, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The good news of Christmas, hundreds of years before Christmas, and when the angels came, they announced good news of great joy. Not because our families are perfect, not because the vegetables are there, not because Beverly has her Brussels sprouts that I won't allow in the house any other time of the year. (laughs) If you look in Hezekiah chapter 3, you will find that Brussels sprouts came in after the fall. Okay. So, all of these things, this peace with God, comes because of what God has done for us. Jesus himself said, my peace I give you. And we know, we know there's an anxiety epidemic in this world. That's why millions are on tranquilizers and tablets. Now we don't criticize that, but often, often, if people had peace with themselves, peace with others, and peace with God, they wouldn't need it. That's the truth. It's a hard truth, but that's the truth for lots of people. We need peace with God. Romans 5 verse 1 says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great truth of the message that we have to proclaim at Christmas. Why should we be embarrassed? This is our message. People need peace. People want peace. Jesus gives us the possibility of a restored relationship with God. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's God's work. It's God's plan of salvation. It's what God wants us to do. Jesus himself is our peace. There's that word once again. If you know anyone called Irene, here's a witness opportunity for you. Tell them what their name means. Explain to them. Making peace through the blood of his cross. We can never apologize for the cross. We can never apologize that that's how we get back into relationship with God. That's the message that we have. That's the hope that we have. One of the questions that you will be asked repeatedly if you haven't already been so is, are you ready for Christmas? I would expect nothing less in the Whiteley household. I would expect the Christmas presents have been bought just after Easter. January. We need to give her our list, Bev. Bev works on the principle, if she can't click it, we don't eat it or we don't wear it. (laughs) It's funny, I know. You know, Nathaniel, you know what happens in our house? She cl- clicks, I have to collect. That, that's the deal. Huh? I bought her an iPad a couple of Christmases ago. Should have prayed first. Should have prayed. Are you ready for Christmas? We all have to make physical preparations. But here's, here's a more important, important question. And I asked it yesterday. Are we ready for the Christ of Christmas? Are we ready for the Christ of Christmas? Now you all look pretty holy this morning. You look as if you had a prayer time before you come out. You look as if you read your Bible sometime this week. But truthfully, even as Christians, we can miss the reason for the season. So there's, a, there's an interesting verse where it talks about, and I, I'll mention it more later, that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. The crowds and the shepherds and others were amazed at what had happened. But Mary pondered them and treasured. And so church, I want to say to you, because we have such a great message, because we know we've been justified by faith, would you make preparations for the Christ of Christmas? Truthfully? Would you not get so busy with the externals, but did you actually make time for the Christ of Christmas in your own life? 
If there's anything in your relationship where you don't have peace with God, then we'd love to pray with you and for you today. But also take this time over these next couple of weeks and get your spiritual life ready for 2020. They talk about 2020 vision. I clearly don't have it. You're all now a blur. Uh, we talk about 2020 vision we're heading into 2020 we're heading into a period where we're going to be encouraging you to, to do a 21 day Daniel fast a, a, a partial fast we're asking you to, to step up at the start of the year we're asking you to do something maybe some of you have never done before because as individuals we need it as a church we need it as a community, we need it. As a nation, we need it. But we can't expect people out there to do it unless we do it. <laughs> and that comes out of being in the right place with God, of being in that place of peace with God. So if there's anything, anything blocking your relationship with God today, don't go into the Christmas season carrying it. Okay? No guilt, no condemnation, no offense, nothing that you can't come into the Christmas period singing joy to the world. Amen. The Lord has come. We will be singing that, won't we? I have made a request. You know, that carol and mince pies, in my humble opinion, as they say on social media, in my humble opinion, are suitable any time of the year. I'm just saying. Just saying. We have loads of mince pies for you today but any time of the year we can sing joy to the world and we can have a mince pie i'm only saying but here's the opportunity for you so what's the next step we've talked about peace being more than the absence of conflict true peace is god taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness and that's what he wants to do in our lives and in those who aren't here yet in our relationship with God, he wants that wholeness. In our relationship with others, he wants that wholeness. And truthfully, sometimes that will mean walking away until the other person is willing to reconcile. And that's okay. That's okay. And where we started off, we need peace with ourselves. You're made in the image of God. Everyone you meet is made in the image of God. You can never meet a person who's not made in the image of God and who's not loved by God. Maybe that'll change our thinking. Maybe that'll change our conversations. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful truth we, we have sung about this morning, we've prayed about. We hear from your scripture. The simple message that we can have peace with ourselves because we're made by you. You are the creator. You are the everlasting God. You're the ter eternal God. You knit us together in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We can celebrate that. Thank you, Lord, you call us into peace with others. Help us to forgive where we need to. And where possible, we pray that we will make every effort to live in peace. That there will be reconciliation were possible this Christmas. And Lord, most importantly, help us to live in peace with you. Help us to not carry that baggage like pilgrim's progress, but come to the cross and give it to you so that we can be free from our burden. We bless your name this morning. In the name of Jesus. Amen.